Hello, so this section, or this two sections, I decided to combine because they're so closely related, I think it would be kind of silly to have two separate sections. Um, so it's one of them's about permutation and one's about combinations, 11.7 and 11.8. So, um, they're, yeah, they're almost the exact same thing, it's just one slight difference. So yeah, I think it'll be even less confusing to put them together rather than having two separate sections that almost seem the same, but one slight difference. So I hope that's okay. We're going to have two sections in one uh, video. So let's see. Uh, and the counting principle, we'll start with that just as a reminder, but I think we already saw this. We'll just do a little review about it. Um, I think some of this got cut off. It's supposed to say an Italian restaurant serves three different entrees, lasagna, spaghetti, and pesto penne. For each entree, diners can choose a side, broccoli or green beans. You are also allowed to choose a soup or salad. Draw a tree diagram. Oops, there's two E's in tree. Draw a tree diagram to determine the total number of choices. All right, so we've seen this before. Let's see, the first, we're going to start here. The first choice is entree. There's lasagna, spaghetti, and pesto penne. Lasagna, spaghetti, and pesto penne. All right, but for each of those, then you can choose, what is it? Oh, a side, broccoli or green beans? Okay, so here's broccoli. Hope it's okay if I just abbreviate for green beans. And then for spaghetti, you can also choose broccoli or green beans. And then lastly, pesto, you can choose broccoli or green beans. All right, and then from there, once you choose the side, you can choose the soup or salad. So from each of these branches, I can choose a soup. Yeah, that's so. This one is when I've chosen lasagna and broccoli. And I can choose soup or salad. How about lasagna and green beans? You can choose soup or salad. I think I remember one of the very first times I was asked that at a restaurant. They said, "Do you want soup or salad?" And I thought they said "super salad." You know, S U P E R, super salad. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. Super salad, all right. <laughs> I think they, the, the waiter or waitress got really confused. And whoops, now it's soup or salad. Anyway, super salad. As far as uh, spaghetti broccoli, this would be spaghetti and green beans. You can have soup or salad. And then if you choose pesto penne and broccoli, you can have soup or salad. And then pesto penne and green beans, you can have soup or salad. Alright, that means you can count the number of, I guess, branches at the very end to see how many choices there are total. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, twelve total choices. That's a lot. But with the counting principle, what we could have done, <coughs> excuse me, what we could have done is said, okay, there's three choices we made. Entree, there were three choices. Multiply that by the number of choices for the side. There were two choices, right? And then multiply that by the number of choices for the soup slash salad. Of course, there's only two. So that's, let's see, 12 choices, right? Yeah, so that's, anyway, that's just a reminder of why tree diagrams are useful, or one of the reasons tree diagrams are useful. Okay, fundamental principle of counting. The total number of possible outcomes for a series of decisions, where you make selections from various categories, is found by multiplying the number of choices for each decision. That's kind of just sums up what we just found out. Or, you know, we found that out before, but we're reiterating. Um, so a good way to do it, if you're trying to use the, the fundamental principle of counting to calculate the number of total decisions in a certain situation, is you can draw a box for each decision, and then enter the number of choices for each decision, then multiply those numbers. Kind of like we did, but we didn't. We just didn't have boxes. I could have had blank, 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 filled in the boxes, and then multiplied. So okay, for part A in this first example, a randomized two-character code is assigned to each employee at a certain business. The first character is a letter of the alphabet. Okay, so maybe that one I'll put a little box for. Okay, so a number of... and there are 26 letters, letters of the alphabet. The second digit is between 0 and 9. Okay, that's actually 10 digits because from 1 to 9 there are 9, plus 0 makes 10. All right, so how many possibilities? Well, multiply them together. 260 total. 
about how many social security numbers are there? Let's see, how many digits are in a social security? Nine, I think. There are nine boxes, I guess. One for each digit. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I, if I, I mean, I'm not really sure, but I'm pretty sure that social security numbers don't have any limitations on them. Like, I don't think there's any rules where it says, oh, the first number can't be a four, or the, the third number can't be the same as the fourth number. I thought, I'm pretty sure that they can be whatever they want. So we have ten possibilities here, because there are ten digits between zero and nine. And I think the same for all of them, right? Ten, that's ten times itself, nine times. So it'd be ten to the ninth power, if you want to write it like that. Or you could just have one followed by nine zeros. That's a lot. One billion, huh? Woo! That's quite a bit. Wowzers. Alright, how about... An employer has 23 employees to assign to a committee of four people. You have a secretary. So, okay, I'm gonna be, I'll put a blank for that. A treasurer. Okay, there's one person there. The president. And then the vice president. Okay, those are the decisions. Who to make the secretary, that's the first decision. Who to make the treasurer? That's the second, and then etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so let's see. There are 23 people or employees on this committee, so there are 23 choices for the secretary. Choices for secretary. But if you think about it, well, I guess they didn't explicitly say this, but usually, um, when let's say we assign Bob, there's a guy named Bob. Bob is going to be the secretary. Usually, that means he's not going to be a treasurer or president or vice president. You know, you either have one job or another. You don't have both. So I'd say that there's one less choice. One less person to choose for the next job. What was it? Treasurer. And then on and on. So now Bob is secretary and then let's say Tammy's treasurer or whatever. So it's two less people than we had to begin with. There were 23. Now there's 21 people left. And then if Sally or whoever is going to be president, then who's vice president? There are only 20 people left. One less person, and then one less person. So every time you're, you're looking at the next job, there's going to be one less person that can do that job. Okay, and then we'll multiply across to see what, um, what the total is. Wow, and that comes out to a grand total of 200, oh, 212,520 um, total possibilities. seems like way more than it should be. Like, yeah, there's only 23 people, but, well, there's a lot of choices. Okay, and then that, notice how we multiplied one number, 23, by the, the one number less than that, 22, one number less than that, 21. So that is what, what leads us into the next part of the section, which is what we call factorials. So a factorial, the definition of a factorial, you write it as a number n exclamation point. That means that number factorial. What it means is take that number n, whatever it is, like 23 in the last example, and multiply it by every number less than it until you get to 1. So 1 less than that, 2 less than that, 3 less than that, on and on until you get down to 1. And that seems really theoretical and complicated, but once we do an example, it'll make sense. So like 7 factorial, that means take that number 7, multiply itself, multiply it by 1 less than that, 6, 1 less than that, 5, 1 less than that, 4, and all the way till we get to 1, 3, 2, 1. And then multiply all those guys together. What's that going to be? Let's see. 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 5,040. Okay, that's a lot. Alright, now let's try this other one. What's well, just two factorials? One, one above the other, so let's see, 6 factorial, that's 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And you notice you could multiply across 6 times 5 times 4 times, you know, yada yada yada, get a number, and then the, the denominator 2, or you can just start reducing. These 4s cancel with these 3s, and these 2s, and these 1s, so really all you're left with is the 6 times the 5 on the top, and 1 on the bottom, but... I can reduce that to a whole number, because remember, the probabilities you want to leave as a fraction, but this isn't a probability, it's just some number, so 30 would be the, the answer for that one. Okay, and that'll be useful in a uh, coming formula. So just with that in mind, let's see this next example, just to see where factorials are useful again. A family with five children moves into a home with five children's bedrooms. 
Man, that's a lot of bedrooms. And how many ways can the children be assigned the different bedrooms? Okay. Let's see, there are five bedrooms. Let's say this is bedroom one, bedroom two. Wait, why am I saying BD, DR? For bedroom. Hello. Bedroom three. Bedroom four. Bedroom five. Alright. So I guess from left to right, let's start with the left. Um, there are five children, so there are five choices for the first room. Five children, five choices for who gets the first room. But once a child is assigned to room one, there are four, there are only four children left to be assigned to room two. One less child to be assigned to room two. Yeah, because there's some some child has already gotten room one, so they're not in the running for room two. And in the same way, there are already two children assigned bedrooms now, so there are only three left. Now that there are three children assigned bedrooms, there are only two left. And once you get down to the last bedroom, everybody has a bedroom except the one child left out, so he or she would have to have that last bedroom no matter what. But it ends up being 5 factorial, which, uh, let's see, is 20 times 6 is 120. Right? 20 times 6? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So with that in mind, factorials will come into play with these formulas that we have. So this section, you, should, you notice the title is Combinations and Permutations, so now we're getting to the meat of this section. The number of ways of selecting R objects from N unlike, unlike objects is this formula. And this is, let's say you focus on this one, it's N, it's like a, a, a subscript N, C, subscript R. And that's important because there's a button on your calculator like that. I'll have to send you a link to where you can see that. Um, let's see, okay. And then, this is the formula. So, okay, just to understand what the formula is saying. It's the number of ways of choosing R objects out of N. So let's, let's say, we haven't seen that yet. We'll see some examples. It could be like, for example, if I said, I'll choose the, I don't know, seven um, toppings on my pizza. For my pizza. Yeah, let's say there's a pizza place. They have seven toppings available. And I only want two. Then there are... Seven choose two possible combinations. Number of possible, I guess, number of possible ways to choose two of the seven topics. Yeah, so so far we've only seen we, like at the children's bedroom, there are five children and five bedrooms, so you're choosing all the bedrooms. But I guess if there were less children, like if there were three children and five bedrooms, then this would be a formula you want to choose, because you're choosing not all of them, but just some of them. Um, so let's see, yeah, the factorial. You got n factorial, that's the total number that you're choosing out of, over r factorial, and r is the number of items you're choosing over n minus r factorial. But just to really understand that formula, let's uh, like do an example just to make sure we really get it. So this example says, uh, there are 10 balls in a bag numbered from 1 to 10. Three balls are selected at random. How many different ways are there of selecting the three balls? So we've already kind of set it up for you. It's, 10 choose 3, because there are 10 things you're choosing from, and 3 you're choosing from. So it'd be that, using that formula, n factorial, so our n is 10, 3 factorial, 10 minus 3 factorial. Alright, let's see, I might simplify that denominator first. I'll figure out what 10 factorial is later. 3 factorial, okay, and then subtract these before you think about the factorial. 10 minus 3 is 7. That's really 7 factorial. And the 3 factorial and the 7 factorial sitting next to each other means you're going to multiply them once you calculate. Um, but you know, we can just write them all out. Let's see, 10 factorial means 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And the 3 factorial, that's 3 times 2 times 1. 7 factorial is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And whenever you use this combination formula, it's probably a good idea to just reduce things first before you try to multiply. I'll reduce all I can. Actually, right above each other, the 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1s all cancel out. So all you're left with is, you don't have to write it out again, but I just want to make it clear. 10 times 9 times 8 over 3 times 2 times 1. Alright, and then I think the 3 and the 2 in the denominator should cancel with something in the numerator. 
Like the two can go into eight four times, the three can go into nine three times. So really you're just left with ten times three times four, which is one twenty possibilities for that. Yeah. And when you use these formulas, all term all things in the de I should say everything in the denominator should cancel if you do it right. In the denominator should cancel. If uh, you know, if everything's done correctly. Which is why we should end up with a whole number. Which actually makes sense, because why would you end up with a fraction? How can you have a fractional number of ways to do something, right? That wouldn't make any sense. It would have to be a, a whole number. And then very similarly, a permutation. Okay, above we talked about combinations. Now we're going to talk about permutations. So let's see, a permutation. It's an ordered arrangement. But you notice that after it says the ordered arrangement, it seems like everything's almost the same. It says the number of ordered arrangements of our objects taken from n unlike objects is bleh, this formula. And the formula is almost the same, but it's missing the r factorial. So remember, common combinations that look like this, it was the same n factorial over n minus r factorial. That's the same thing, but there was an extra part here, r factorial. That guy's the difference. Okay, but the hardest part about this section is when how to know when to use which formula. That's definitely the hardest part. So. Um, like it says, the main thing is ordered arrangements. I think that word wasn't in the other, the the, uh, the combinations formula and the the directions for it. So that's I guess I would ask myself, does order matter? If order matters, use permutations. Um, if order doesn't matter. Combinations and CR. Okay, and pretty soon I'll, I'll talk about how do you how do you figure those guys out in your calculator. It's really nice if you have a scientific calculator, a TI, something like a TI thirty, TI thirty two, or even the big boys TI eighty something. Those guys can calculate these for you. You just have to find out where those buttons are. That's all. Okay, and order matters. Okay, what is what would that mean? In the last example, what did we say we were finding? Um, there, are, there are 10 balls in a bag numbered from 1 to 10. Three balls are selected at random. How many different ways are there to select the balls? So I guess it sounds like, let's just say, they're numbered from 1 to 10. Let's say you end up with 3, 7, and 5, I guess. You know, let's say those are the ones that you ended up with. Okay, well you chose 3, three out of the, out of the how many? 10 balls, yeah, right. 3 out of the 10. But I think they're... It doesn't matter what order you chose them in, you know? Like, if I chose ball number three, and then ball number seven, and then ball number five, versus if I had chosen ball number five first, and then ball number three, and then ball number seven. I think it doesn't matter. That's really the same thing, because you end up with the same balls. You know? I guess there are some situations where it matters what order you choose things in. But in this situation, I don't think it matters. You just want to know, what numbers am I left with here? Three, five, and seven. Or five, three, and seven. But there are, yeah, there are some... <clears throat> excuse me, situations where you care what order you got them in. Like if I got 3, 7, then 5, I would count that different than 5, 3, then 7. So it's, it's more rare, I think, permutations. You don't need to use that as often. But here's an example here. Um, in the match of the day's goal... Wait. The match of the day's goal of the month competition, you had to pick the top three goals out of ten. Since the order is important... Yeah, right? Because... Do -do -do. The top three goals, yeah, so it sounds like when they say top three goals, you're going to say goal number one, here. Goal number two, here. Goal number three, here. But if you were to switch them around, somehow, like, you'd switch your goals. Uh, yeah, switching them around would be different. The order of the goals makes a difference in this situation. You know, my number one goal, my number two goal, if I switch them, now my number two is my number one, and I have a different number one goal, which which is different, right? But if I'm just picking three ba balls out of a bag, what does it matter if I pick ball number three first or ball number seven first? I end up with the same ones in my hand later anyway. So, you know, it doesn't matter. But in this case, order matters. That's why we're using permutations. So it'd be the same formula, but just simpler, because it's just um, n factorial over n minus r factorial. 
So almost the same as the previous examples formula, we're just, um, we don't need that extra 3 factorial in the denominator. And of course, just like in the last one, we're going to subtract those first. 10 minus 3 is 7, and then calculate that factorial. So I'll, I'll write it out. 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And then 7 factorial is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Alright, and then just like with combinations, everything should cancel from the, the denominator. Like, where do we say that? Yeah, that's true for permutations as well. So let's see, 7's cancel, 6 is cancel, 5's, 4's, 3's, 2's, 1's. So you're just left with 10 times 9 times 8, which is 720 possibilities for that. Alright, so now, the last examples here are just going to be mixed up examples where we're either going to be using the counting principle or combinations or permutations. We just got to think about, in this situation, which would we use, I guess. Yeah. Um, but let me, let me see what website you... Oh yeah, I'll try to give you a website you can go to to see what buttons to press on your calculator to use permutations and combinations. Okay, so basically, if you have a Texas Instruments calculator, because those are the only ones I'm familiar with, um, either have an TI-80 something, like 82, 83, 84, in which case you're going to press the math button. There should be a math button. And then go over to the right. These are just you pressing the right button. Right, right. Until you hit probability. P-R-O-B. And then you're going to go down until you find what you want. You're either going to... You're going to see NPR for permutations or NCR for combinations. Or actually you could have a factorial for factorials. And that way you don't have to actually use the formula. You don't have to write it out and all that. You can... It's fine to use the calculator. But on the other hand, if you have a TI-30 something, like mine I think is a TI-30X, but if you have a TI-32 or I don't know, anything else, it should be the same thing. There is a PRB button that stands for probability. Once you press that, you should see exactly what you want, either NPR, NCR, or factorial. You just gotta use your cursor to press right to, until you find it, and that's press enter. That's what I, I guess I should say that. Press enter to use it. Enter. Okay. And then let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something I wanted to make note of. For both of those calculators, you have to, let's see, um, enter N first. Then you grab this. Then enter R. Okay, that sounds confusing, but if, uh, just for example, if I wanted to calculate, um, what did we have before? Like, N, um, 10 permutations with three choices. Then on the calculator, I would press 10 first, you know, on the digits 1, 0, and then do all that PRB, you know, whatever the case may be up there, grab NPR, enter, and then once I press enter, then I'm going to press the 3. So it's, it's confusing, you have to press the left number first, and then go find the NPR or NCR, whatever you're finding, or whatever, and then the right number, 3. So try to, try to practice that. Um, you know what, and if you can't figure it out, you're thinking, man, I don't really get it. I think you can just search on YouTube. On YouTube. Um, like TI, you know, whatever your calculator is, 30X or TI 8483 with permutations. Actually, if you probably just put one of those two in, whatever your calculator is, and permutations, that should come up. But you can throw in combinations as well. And th there's someone that's going to show you... Um, a video on how to on how to use your calculator for that. Yeah, and then if you have a different kind of calculator, I'm sorry, unfortunately, I'm not familiar with any other brand besides Texas Instruments. Um, but you could just search permutations and combinations on the calculator and specify which calculator you have. That's probably the best way to go about it. And I'm sure there's a YouTube video or some website explaining it to you. But okay, now that we have that, I think we're ready to try these mixed up examples. And I'm just going to use my calculator. I have a TI-30 right here. Um, we gotta decide, is it gonna be, uh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the, either use the counting principle, like we did above, where we have a little box for each one, you know, and then multiply the results, or permutations, or combinations. Alright, let's see. I'm gonna try to say when you would use each. So let's see. Um, the counting principle, you would use that, I would say, used when you're able to choose the same 
I don't know, item or person or whatever you're choosing. Item. More than once, I should say, not twice. So it's like, if you can replace. Remember we said with replacement? It's kind of like that. Like, um, yeah, like what are the example we did above where, like with the social security number. Um, yeah, if I wanted a social security number, then I can choose the same number more than once. Whereas permutations and combinations, you can't choose the same um, number or item more than once. Used when you can't choose the same item more than once. I think we call that without replacement. But how do you narrow it down between those, you know? Like, what if there's an example where you say, okay, well, it's, this is without replacement, but how do I know if I'm using permutations or combinations? Well, remember above we said, just, and then once, you, once you're there, ask yourself, does order matter? With permutations, the order you choose the items in matters. Like, if I choose the same items twice, but in a different order, I consider that a different possibility. So permutations, order matters, and combinations, order doesn't matter. Okay. So actually, if you want, we can create like a little flowchart thing. So yeah, if you, if you like flowcharts, I actually think they're kind of awesome. Such a nerd. Okay, so the first question is, um, can you use the same item more than once? Can you choose the same, you know, item or person or whatever more than once? Okay, if the answer is yes, then you're going to use um, the counting principle, which is like we said, where you're going to just put bo boxes and fill in the number, like like with the social security number, right? It was for every digit there are ten, so I made a little box. Ten times ten times ten times ten. Um, but if it's a no, well, it could be permutations or combinations. You're going to ask yourself now, does order matter? Or does the order I choose the items in matter? I choose the items in matter? Question mark. If it's a yes, then you want to use permutations. If it's a no, then you want to use combinations. Alright, so I kind of like flowcharts anyway. <laughs> it's this nerdy, but whatever. Okay, so how about, how many different zip codes are possible? First of all, when I choose numbers for a zip code, can I choose the same item more than once? Yes, I can. I can have a zip code with the same number twice, right? So I'm going to use the counting principle. Which is, okay, there are five numbers in a zip code, right? Last time I checked. Four, five, and they can be any digit of the ten digits from zero to nine. So it's multiplied ten by itself five times. Ten to the fifth power, or one followed by five zeros. Hundred thousand. So there are hundred thousand possible zip codes. All right. How many zip codes are possible if the first number must be a three or a four? All right. Well, that's just a little stipulation or a little uh, extra thing to remember. But I'll still consult that flowchart. Can I choose the same number more than once? Yeah, just because they said the first number has to be a 3 or 4 doesn't mean I can't choose the same number more than once. So I'm still using the counting principle. It's just, I think, one of, maybe one or more of the numbers that I'm putting in the boxes is going to be different than the last one. So the first number must be a 3 or a 4. Think about, if you think about it, it's only two choices. It doesn't really matter that they're 3 and 4. It could be anything. It could be 0 and 1. But the fact is that you only have two choices for the first digit. But it sounds like the other digits can be anything. They can be any of the ten digits. So the rest of them will be the same as in the last part, or the last example. But the first digit is, can only be a th three or a four. So that's two times ten times ten times ten. That's two followed by four zeros. Twenty thousand. So that really that drastically reduces the number of, of possibilities, right? Just because you made the first number a three or a four instead of anything. Okay. How about the next one? How many different groups of people can sit in five chairs if there are nine people ready to sit down? Okay, so this already sounds like a permutation or combination because you're choosing a smaller number out of a bigger number. How many groups, different groups of people can sit in five chairs if there are nine people ready to sit down? Alright, well let's consult the flowchart. Can you choose the same item more than once? No, because two people can't sit in the same chair. You're only choosing each chair once. 
We're going down the no path this way. Does the order I choose the items in matter? Well, this is kind of a tough one. How many people can sit in five chairs if there are nine people ready to sit down? Okay, this is a tough one. I think something like this probably wouldn't be on a test because it's kind of hard to tell. But I'm feeling like order doesn't matter. I kind of just I get the feeling that it doesn't matter what seat they sit in. You know, like person A can sit in the seat in the corner or as long as they get a seat. I, I guess I'm picturing a what's that game you play? Musical chairs. Like as long as you end up with this with a seat, it doesn't matter where you sat or what order you chose it in. So that's what I'm thinking. But yeah, like on an exam, I'll try to make it more clear that order does matter or order doesn't. It'll be really obvious. So order doesn't matter, that means you're using NCR, the combination one. And let's see, then N is 9, because there are a total of 9 people. And I'm going to choose 5 of them to sit in the chairs. I'm going to use my calculator, let's see, and again, I'm typing the 9 in first. And then I'm pressing, going to probability, grabbing NCR, not NPR. Pressing enter, pressing 5, and then enter. So my calculator shows, it looks like 9... NCR5. That's what it's displaying when I'm done. And I press enter. And I get 126. So there are 126 possible outcomes there. And then the next part, how many ways are there to arrange the letters in the word credit? Oh, okay. Well, that's a good one. I think this one you could use the counting principle, actually, or you could use, um, what's it called? A combination of permutation. But let's, let's look at the flowchart. Can you choose the same item more than once? No. No, 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 no. Can't. So I think, yeah, they're, they're arranging those letters, but you're not going to use one of the letters twice. Can't use the same item more than once. Okay. So we got that down. It means we're going to be using permutations or combinations, and then does the order I choose them in matter? I would say order does matter. Because these are words, you know? Like if I took the word credit and rearranged the letters, that would be that'd be a different um yeah, that'd be a different, right? If I put if I wrote it backwards, T I D E R C, you're gonna think, what the hell? That's not the same word. Since order matters, that means we're gonna use N P R. But then how about how many things are we choosing out of? Well there are six letters to choose from, so it'd be six permutations of and how many are we choosing? Well actually we're choosing all six of them. Choosing all six of six letters. Alright, so I can use a calculator if I want. Yeah, in my calculator again it's going to be six, and then I'll go to probability, choose the NPR, and then six. So let's see, six, probability, NPR, six. I get 720. Holy shamoly, that's a lot. Wow. Holy moly, you guys. And then, let's see, there are... Oh, and this one, you could, well, you could have done actually instead, sorry. If you, for some reason, if someone didn't know about permutations and combinations, you could have said, okay, there are six letters. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six choices for the first one, but once that guy's chosen, there's one less to choose for the second one, one less for the third one, one less for the fourth one, and then on and on and on. And I think you're going to get the same answer, right? I mean, theoretically, you should. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so don't worry. Sometimes... I think it's when you're choosing all of them, Al alternately, when choosing all items, like how we're choosing six of the six. We weren't choosing, like in the last one, five of the nine chairs. If we were choosing nine of the nine chairs, we could do it this way. But let's see, uh, last one. There are 11 people on a committee. How many different ways can the committee roles of president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer be filled? Well, first of all, with the flowchart, can you choose the same item more than once? No, because I don't... You're not supposed to... I mean, I've never seen a committee where one person has more than one job. Like, I'm president and I'm vice president at the same time. So I don't think... You can't choose the same person for two different jobs. The same... You know, item or person more than once. once. Okay, so that means it's permutation or combination. And then the second question, does the order I choose the items in matter... I would say yes. Order matters because if I choose this person for secretary versus I choose the same person for treasurer, they have different jobs. Because the order I choose people in affects oops, 
Nope. Effect with the A. I know that one. Effect. Effect is the aftermath. Affect is the verb. Alright. English majors, I got you. Uh, the people's jobs. Yeah. I'd rather be chosen fourth because I want to be president. Oh no, sorry. I want to be chosen first because I want president rather than secretary or something lame like that. So I think what we're doing is we're going to choose NPR, where N is the total number of things we're choosing out of, which is people. How many people are there? Eleven. And how many jobs do we have? There are four, right? No. Yeah, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. Four jobs. So we're choosing four of the eleven people. Let me use my calculator. Eleven probability NPR four. Ooh, I got a lot. Seven thousand nine hundred twenty. That is a lot. Wow. Yeah, I think <laughs> I always tell my students, like if in the face to face classes, if you're doing permutations and combinations and you get an answer that seems way too big like that, say there's no way that's right. You're probably right, because there's there's always way more combinations and permutations than you think there are. Hello, next section here. So this section, it combines the, the combinatorics, which I don't know if we even give it a name, but the combinations and permutations, we call that the study of combinatorics. It's actually kind of fun to say, right? Um, so we, we combine that with probability. And this is probably as complicated as it'll get for us. Um, so let's see. Some complicated probabilities can only be calculated using combinatorics, which is, you know, the permutations and combinations. <clears throat> so I think to me one of the most interesting things in probability studies is what they call the birthday problem which we'll see in the second example but just to kind of get us warmed up let's do this first example and then I think that the kind of more complicated birthday problem will be a lot easier to wrap our minds around so the first example asks what is the probability that at least two people in a group of five have the same birthday all right well I think we mentioned this before it was like we didn't say it I don't know too much we said it one time but whenever you see, I shouldn't circle the word two, it's more the words at least. So remember we mentioned that at least, I don't know, at least one, blah blah blah, or at least two, blah blah blah. Those probabilities are very difficult to calculate. These are difficult to calculate. And that's because if I say at least two people in a group of five have the same birthday, that means, <clears throat> well, two people could have the same birthday, and then three people could have the same birthday, four people could have the same birthday, five people could, or here's a pair that have the same birthday, and here's another pair, or here's three that have the same birthday, and this other pair does. So I think that's why at least probabilities are very hard to calculate, because it covers so many, I don't know, so many different things that could be happening. So what we do is we're going to calculate the opposite of that. Calculate the opposite, okay. And if you think about it, what's the opposite of me saying at least two people in a group of five have the same birthday? Or in other words, if I were to say it is not true that at least two people in a group of five have the same birthday, that would mean that no one has the same birthday, right? No one have the same birthday. Or you could say, all, all unique birthdays. And also, by the way, birthday, by birthday I mean the, the month and the, and the day of the month. I don't mean the year. So yeah, when they say same birthday, we mean not the year, just, you know, like January 12th or something. That's it. As long as January 12th, it doesn't matter what year it is, then that would be the same birthday. So that's what we'll calculate now. And then we'll use... That, that formula that was really not as useful before, but now it's very useful. The probability of something not happening is 1 minus the probability of it happening. So we'll calculate the probability that no one has the same birthday, and then just subtract it from 1, and that'll tell us what we want to know. So let's see. Um, what's the probability that none of the five have the same birthday? Okay, well, why'd I put a question mark? Well, let's see, the numerator is the number of ways you can choose 5 out of 365 days of the year. So that's either a permutation or a combination. And remember, permutations and combinations already are without replacement, both. No replacement. Which means if I choose 5 of the days of the year for these 5 people to have birthdays on, I'm not going to have the same day twice. 
So it's already built in that I'm not going to have the same birthday for two people because there's no replacement when you're talking about permutations and combinations. So it's a number, yeah, number of ways to choose five of 365 days. Okay, and that's that's kind of a tricky one, whether it's a permutation or combination. Remember, permutation means the order you choose the dates in matters, and combination means that the order doesn't matter. But if you think about it, these are people. Of course they care about when their birthday is, so if Tom's up first and I pick a random day of the year for his birthday to fall on, I think he'd care, you know, if he got that day or a different day if I switched them. So I'd say order matters. Usually when people are involved, order matters. Because these are people's birthdays. Yeah, if it, if it wasn't for people's birthdays, if I just said, I'm going to grab five random days of the year and put them in a, in a box. You know, I write them down on a piece of paper, put them in a box, and then you mix them up. Then it really didn't matter what order I put them in because they're just being randomized anyway in that box. But if they're being assigned to people's birthdays, then that's when it really matters. So let's see, that, would, that means it's a number of permutations. Or sorry, a permutation from 365... I guess we're assuming it's not a leap year, um, and you're taking five because there's five people here for the birthdays. <clears throat> and how many total number of ways are there to choose a birthday? Well, for each person, there are 365 days of the year they could choose. So this is for person one multiplied by, <clears throat> so using the counting principle here, 365 days of the year for person two, because again, this is the total number of ways you can choose birthdays. There's, yeah, once you choose a birthday for the first person, <clears throat> it's still possible that the second person has that birthday. So for every person of the, for every one of these five people, they each have 365 days of the year they could have been born. Person three, person four, person five. So the denominator ends up being 365 to the fifth power, because it's 365 multiplied by itself five times. And then I think these two numbers are pretty similar. Let's see. And we talked about how to calculate these on your calculator. Um, in the previous section, but if you want, you can always do these the long way, because this is 360 from the formula, 365 factorial, <clears throat> excuse me, over 365 minus 5 factorial. And you can calculate it, you can write it out, that's 365 times 364 times 363 times 362 times 361 times 360. And you know what, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to, I know how it goes from there, it goes 359, 358. But I'm going to stop there, because I know in the denominator I have this is 360 factorial. So it's 360 times 359 times on and on and on. So all the numbers 360 and on will cancel with what's in the numerator. And all you're left with is the stuff in the numerator. 365 times 364 times 363 times 362 times 361. And that'll give you one way to do it. Um, but you can always use a calculator. On the calculator I get 6.3... 02555019 times 10 to the 12th power. And for the denominator, 365 to the 5th power, I get 6.47834872 times 10 to the 12th power. So pretty similar numbers. And then I'll divide those. And actually, it's probably easier to leave, once you calculate um, the permutation part, this guy, just leave that on your calculator, you know, on the screen and then press divide. So I'll probably do that. I'll go 365 permutations of 5 press enter on the calculator and then once it's showing up on my screen I'll press the divide button and then what I would do is probably a good idea to put parentheses 365 to the power of, that's the power of button on the calculator 5 and then enter. And That's probably a good way to go about it and I think you won't you know, mess it up from there. Because I know it's, it's really easy to kind of mess things up on the calculator. So I'm going to try that. 365 permutations of 5. Now it's sitting on my screen. I'll press divide, parentheses, 365 to the 5th power, close the parentheses, enter. And I got point, let's see, 9728644426. Alright, and we'll round probably when we get to the end. But remember, the probability we want is the opposite of that, not e. So what we want is 1 minus what we just found, that number right there. Here, I'm going to bring it over. Do -do 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 -do. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was it? Point 
7286-4426. Okay. That's the end. Oh, that's, I don't need to say approximately equal to. That's going to be 0 0.027135574. Okay, and that's, that's the decimal form of the probability. Probably a more useful form is um, percent form. And remember, to change something to percent form that's in decimal form, all you do is move the decimal twice to the right and add a percent symbol. So it becomes 2 point, yeah, you could just say 2.7%. That's probably pretty good. Okay, now the big birthday problem. So th let's see, the last example we said if there are five people in a room, what's the probability that at least two of them have the same birthday? But what if it wasn't five people in a room? What if it was 10, 20, 30? You know, how would you know? Yeah, what would be the probability there? So, um, this actually, this question is kind of confusing to wrap your mind around at first. But okay, this says, how many people would need to be in a room in order for it to be more likely than not that at least two of them have the same birthday? And like I said before, the day and the month, but not the year. So, a way to think about that would be, I guess, what if someone said, hey, I'll bet you I don't know, $50 or however much that matters to you. $50 that no one in this, this room has the same birthday as someone else. Then how many people would have to be in the room in order for you to take that bet? You know, that you'd say, oh, I, yeah, I want to take that bet. So I think the first time I saw this problem, I think I thought, like, 100 maybe. If there's 100 people in the room, I guess I'd say, it's probably more likely that two of them have the same birthday than none of them have the same birthday, right? So if you think about the last example, what was it? The answer... previous example because remember the previous example had five people and right now we're kind of talking about I don't know how many people um, what was it the answer was 1 minus 365 permutations of 5 over 365 to the fifth power but remember we had to subtract that from 1 because that was the opposite of what we wanted that was for five people but how about if we, if we didn't know how many people we had for n people, so just some number of people, n, then we could actually do, all the same thinking would be involved, but we'd have to just replace the fives in that little answer with n. 365 to the n power. So if you try, I guess what, what would you want? You'd want this, this probability to be greater than 0.5, because 0.5 that's 50% chance, right? So if you have less than 50% chance, that means it's not very, not as likely, but if you have more than 50% chance, it's very likely. So if you try all different kinds of n, n equals 5, like in the last example, n equals 10, n equals 20, n equals dot 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 dot. So that's really what you do, you just keep trying different n values. Or, you know, whoever came up with this problem, that's what they did. But then they found that n equals 23 is the answer. That's because if you, were, if you were to plug that in, 1 minus 365 permutations of 23 over 365 to the 23rd power, that's about 0.51 if you round it, which is 51%. So if there's 23 people in a room, you have a 51% chance that at least two of them have the same birthday. That doesn't seem like a lot, right? That's why I like this problem. It seems very counterintuitive. People are in a room. There is about a 51% chance that at least two have the same birthday. That seems like very few people, right? I thought it would be at least like 100 people would have to be in a room. Anyway, so that's sometimes math is very counterintuitive, but I think that's pretty interesting. And of course, if you had more people, 24, 25, 100, 200, the chance goes up and up and up. Um, but if you're below 23, it's like, you know, it goes to 40-something percent, and then 30-something percent, and then all the way down to, like in the previous example, 2.7 percent chance. Okay. So anyway, that's pretty interesting. Alright, this next example is kind of complicated. If you're familiar with the lottery, it helps, but you don't really need to be. <clears throat> it says, some states in the U.S. <clears throat> operate a 644 lottery, which means that a gambler selects six numbers from 1 through 44, 
and order doesn't matter, so you select the six numbers, and if you chose them in the wrong order, quote-unquote, it doesn't matter. It's, as long as you have the six numbers in some order, um, and no number can be chosen more than once, if they match all six winning numbers in any order, they win first prize. If they match five of the six, they win second prize. So first, let's find the probability of a gambler winning first prize with a single lottery ticket. Okay. Well, that'd be the number of ways to choose all six. <laughs> all six winning numbers. Someone wants attention. Over the total number of ways to choose your six numbers out of 44. Your six numbers of 44. Okay, well let's see. They said order doesn't matter, right? So order doesn't matter means we're using combinations, not permutations. Order doesn't matter. So first, yeah, first of all, to note that <clears throat> the numerator, really what we're doing is we're choosing six of the six winning numbers. So out of the six winning numbers, I want to choose six. Remember the left number is how many you're choosing out of and the right number is how many you're choosing. And that's over the total the number of ways to choose your numbers. You're choosing six out of 44. So you want to choose the six that are correct, six out of the six that are correct. And that end, the numerator ends up being a one if you use your calculator or you do it with the formula. But which that makes sense because how many ways are there to get the winning ticket? There's only one way to choose the, num the right numbers, right? So it makes sense that it would be a 1. How about the denominator? You're going to get 44 combinations of 6, let's see, 7, 0, 5, 9, 0, 5, 2. So about 7 million. You have a 1 in a 7 million shot of getting the correct lottery ticket. I mean, that's if you're playing that particular lottery. So not great. And then part B, let's find the probability that a gambler wins second prize with a single lottery ticket. Okay, this is actually really complicated. Probably, I would say, even too complicated for our quizzes or exams. This is kind of interesting, I guess, for fun. Exams. Okay, that's because we have to choose, well, if you think about it, winning second prize means you chose five of the six winning <coughs> numbers. <coughs> Excuse me, numbers. And then you also cho chose whoops, one of the Let's see, how many losing numbers are there? I was going to say 44. Well, 44 is the total number. 44 minus 6 is 38. There's 38 losing numbers and 6 winning numbers. So what I want to happen is I want to choose 5 of the 6 correct. And I'll, at the same time, and I want to uh, choose 1 of the 38 that's incorrect. And I have to multiply those together. Plus the, yeah, the... A number of ways that we can, <laughs> that we can get second prize. And then we want add a total number, which is the same as the last part. So I know the denominator already. It was what? 7,059,052? Oops. What about the numerator? I have to get, multiply those together. Um, let's see. 625. Actually, this is 6. And I think this guy is 38. How many ways are there to choose one number out of 38? Well, there's 38 ways. If I multiply those together, I get 228. There we go. And then, you know, if you want, you can reduce this fraction. Or you can make, I think what makes it easier is actually making it um, a decimal and then a, a percent. For some reason, percents make a lot more sense. You can wrap your mind around them easier, I, I think. That's, oh, not so good. 0. 0.00003229. Uh oh. I'm going to move the decimal over twice, so there's a 0.0032299% chance. Not great, not great. How about the previous one? It was 7 million, 1 divided by 7 million, <coughs> 59. Oh, that's really bad. Point. How many zeros is that? 1, 2, 3, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then 1, 4, 2. Move the decimal over twice, it's, oh my gosh. 0.00001 chance. So yeah, no wonder no one, you know, you don't know anyone that won the lottery. But in case you're curious, if you ever come across a calculation like this in another class, I guess, I'm um, in calcula complicated calculations like in part B above, you can check to make sure you didn't miss anything by adding all numbers in front of the C's for the total number of choices, and then adding all numbers after the C's for the number of picks. 
So notice the 6 here and the 38. If you add those together, that's the total number of items we had to choose from. Because there were 44 numbers. 38 equals 44 numbers to choose from. And then the numbers after the C's, 5 and 1, if you add those, that's 6 that we chose. So if you end up with a number other than that, you know, that's not really the number I chose, and this, that's not the, or, and or that's not the number that I was choosing out of, then you must have missed something. Because I don't know if I would have remembered to put this 6 choose 5 and 38 choose 1. But if you, you know, if you kind of go by this rule, then you won't forget. So how about the Powerball lottery? That's kind of interesting. The Powerball lottery involves selecting 5 of the numbers from 1 through 59, inclusive, so 1 and 59 are also part of it, plus a Powerball number from 1 through 39, inclusive. Find the probability of winning first prize, which is getting all numbers correct. So I guess we need, we need to choose the five winners in the 1 through 59. And we need to choose the one correct out of the 39 numbers. Okay, so we want to choose five of the five winning numbers. Five out of... Yeah, because if you get less than five winning numbers correct, it's not first prize. And you need to choose the one that's correct. Yes. And that ends up being a one in the numerator, which makes sense, because how many ways can you win the lottery? There's only one way. You get all those five numbers right, and you get the one number right. There's no other way to get the you know, first prize in the lottery. Only one way all correct numbers. And then in the denominator, how many total number of ways are there? Let's see, I'm choosing for the for the five numbers, I'm choosing five out of 59 numbers. Remember, the denominator, you're not trying to be correct. It's just the total number of outcomes. And then for the one out of 39 numbers, I'm choosing one of the 39. And that's it. So let's see what that is. 59... Choose, it's 59, right? Yeah, 59. Choose 5. Woo. So that, I'm, oh, I guess I could multiply them together, but just to show my work. It's 5006386. Zero, zero, six, six. So that's 5 million and some change multiplied by this guy's 39. Wow. So let's multiply those together. Times 49. 1 over 19524954. It's about 195, you have a 1 out of 195 million shot of winning the Powerball. 1 divided by, let's see what that is as a percent. If you make it a decimal, it's, ooh, how many zeros is that? Oh my gosh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I think. Is it? Wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, No, I think 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then a 5. Oh my gosh, and that's a decimal form. If you move the, per the decimal over to the right twice, there's still 6 zeros after the decimal. Of that percent chance. Very low chance. Yeah, so if you wonder, hey, I play the Powerball all the time, how come I never win? Yeah, that's that's kind of why right there. I think someone was telling me, you never see mathematicians gambling. And I think this is why, because mathematicians can calculate the probability and it's not so great. And how about back to cards, huh? Where else do you gamble? In a casino, hello. So yeah, this kind of reminds us what the standard deck of playing cards looks like. The standard deck of 52 playing cards is used to play poker. Okay, so first of all, poker, you get five cards are dealt. And order doesn't matter. I don't know if you're not familiar with playing cards. Because they deal you cards, and you have five in your hand, and you can rearrange them if you want. So it doesn't really matter what order you got them in, you can always rearrange them. And then just as a reminder, the deck consists of 13 denominations, which are Ace, King, Jack, or Arthur, Jaden. Ace, King, Queen, Jack, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 4 suits, hearts, diamonds, clubs, spades. So let's find the probability that if, you know, if they hand you 5 cards of the 52, that they contain 4 twos. Alright, interesting. So I think we're going to have to use, for all these maybe, we might have to use that, um, this idea here. Because this is, these are complicated. So in other words, contain 4 twos, but unspoken they say, and one card that's not a two. So they didn't mention that. So let's see, I think, you know what, if you think about all these guys' probabilities, the denominator is the total number of outcomes. 
but in parts A through D, A, B, C, D, the total number of outcomes is the same because you're just choosing five out of the 52 cards. Or, you know, you're being dealt. So it'd be, and then since order doesn't matter, we're going to use combination, not permutation. The good thing is all these parts, once I think about it once, I don't need to think about the denominator again. It's going to be something over 52, choose 5. But yeah, because we're, we're playing poker every time. It doesn't matter, really. Um, but let's see. So I think this is one we'll have to multiply stuff. Um, like here, four twos. Okay, I want four of the four twos. Four of the four twos, which means I have to pick all of them. And then multiply by, I need one, I'm going to choose one card that's not a two. So if there are four twos, 52 minus four is 48. That's the total number, or er, total number of non-two cards, if that makes sense. There are four twos, the rest of them must not be two. So I want to choose one of the 48. And like I mentioned before, I can check my work. Um, do the numbers in front of the C's add up to the total number of things I'm choosing out of? Yes, four and 48 adds up to 52. The numbers after the C's, four plus one is five. That's the number of items that I'm actually um, choosing. Well, I guess I'm not choosing, but someone's choosing for me. And then, let's see, that first number there, 4 choose 4 is 1. Let me just make sure. I think it is, right? Yeah, okay. And then, <clears throat> 48 choose 1 <clears throat> is 48. Yeah, it makes sense. And if you, yeah, if you reason that out, you might not even have to use a calculator. How many ways are there to choose 4 out of 4 items? <clears throat> Excuse me, there's only one way. Yeah, you just grab all 4 of them. And this one, how many ways are there for me to choose 1 out of 48 items? There's 48, because I could choose any of the 48. But the denominator, that's a lot more complicated. Um, how many ways are there for me to choose 5 out of 52? Ooh, that's, that's a big number. 2, 5, 9, 8, 9, 6, 0. Two, about 2.5 or 2.6 million. So it's 48 out of 2.6 million. Wow, that's big. Let's see, I'm going to calculate that. 48 divided by that guy. It's 0.00001846. If I move the decimal over twice, that's 0.001846.9 percent chance. Not great. Okay, so especially part B, this is this one's kind of more for fun. It's very complicated. So this one is what are the what is the chances that your your hand contains four of a kind? So four of a kind, if you think about it, that could be, you know, four aces, four kings, four queens, four jacks, four tens. So we have to do, a, like, a multi-step thing. First, we have to choose, or how, we got to think about how many ways are there to choose, to choose the um, denomination for your four of a kind. So I guess, how many denominations are there? Thirteen. So first of all, I'm choosing one of the thirteen denominations, and then I have to multiply that by... Okay, once I choose the, the denomination, I want to choose four of the four cards in there. Okay, then also, I need to choose... Okay, although this one ends up not having... This is a one. So that one you could have... I don't know, you didn't really need to. There's only one way to choose four or four cards. And then you want to choose... Let's see, one card from the remainder of the card. Let's see, so there are 52 minus the 13 that are in that denomination that you chose. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, wait, right? No, out of the four. You want to choose uh, of the four. Let's see, so 48. One of the wrong ones. Okay. So ends up being 13 times 48 on top. Denominator same as the previous one. It's two million five hundred ninety-eight thousand nine hundred sixty. Let's see what it is. Fifteen times forty-eight, and that divided by two million five hundred ninety-eight thousand nine sixty. It's about point zero 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 two four zero zero nine six. If I move the decimal twice, I end up with point zero two four percent. So that's about point zero two percent. Not a great chance, right? <laughs> so four of a kind, if you're banking on that, it's not a good idea to bank on that. 
those. It's not gonna happen. Don't don't uh, get your hopes up on that one. Wow. Contains all spades, right? What I wanna do is choose five of the how many spades are there? Thirteen spades. Five of the thirteen spades. Um, and that's it, that's all five cards. I guess if it said four spades, I would say choose four of the fifteen spades and the other one must be something else, but that's all our cards right there. This part was way easier than the previous part. 13 choose 5. That's 1,287. And that's over that same denominator. 2 million. What is it? Uh, 598,000. And 960. Alright, as a decimal, that's about 2,098,960. 0 If I move the decimal twice, it's about a point oh. Five percent chance. Yeah, you don't be sad. All right, the last one. It's a flush, which means all the same suit. Okay, so that's like um, the previous one. All the same suit. Either all spades, all hearts, yeah, etc. So it'd be almost the same as the last one, but I have to choose one of the four suits. So it's there. Yeah, choose one. in the last one. So it's almost the same as part C, except you have to add this extra where it doesn't matter if, I mean, yeah, we're not specifying spades or hearts or diamonds or whatever. That's 4 times 1287, all divided by that 2,598,960. 4 times 1287, divided by 25996, oh wait, 2598,960. Sorry, 807.92. If I move the decimal over twice, that's about a 0.2% chance. Not great. Well, you know what you could have done, actually? You could have taken the, pre the probability in part C, which was this guy, and multiplied it by 4, because there are 4 suits. So that would have worked, too.